Welcome folks, my name is Dr. Saeed Kazmi, you're watching my YouTube channel and if you are new to my channel, please don't forget to subscribe and please smash that bell icon so whenever I upload a new video, you are always on board with me. So today we are going to talk about uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, not a very uh, common entity but this is something you would never like to miss. So without further ado, let's dive and get started. So by definition, subarachnoid hemorrhage is bleeding into the subarachnoid space. You know the brain is covered by three layers, the dura matter, the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. Now the subarachnoid space is the space between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. The pia matter is the innermost lining which is covering all the surface of the brain and it dips down wherever there are the sulci and obviously it covers the gyri as well. Now this space that is between the pia matter and the arachnoid matter which is known as the subarachnoid space, this is actually traversed by different veins which are known as the bridging veins. Now if there is bleeding into this space and obviously it's caused by you know uh, rupturing of these bridging veins in the subarachnoid space then there would be accumulation of blood in this space which we call a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now why it is considered to be a dangerous entity because this blood when it would accumulate in this space this is going to cause pressure on the surface of the brain. Our brain is quite soft so the brain is going to give way so this will lead to pressure effects which would mean that the surrounding neurons would be compressed, there might be edema inside in the brain and then these neurons because of the pressure effects they can die and that can lead to uh, serious consequences for the patient. So that's why it is considered to be an important entity not to be missed. As I told you earlier, it is something which is not very common, but it is a very important entity. So even if it is uncommon, you would never like to miss that. Now there are two basic reasons for subarachnoid hemorrhage. First one is the traumatic. Now this is most common in the elderly population because of their frailty, they have got a tendency to fall and especially if these elderly population, if they are on, uh, you know, special type of drugs which we call as anticoagulants because of various reasons, then they are more prone to have subarachnoid hemorrhage if they've got a head injury. So by and large, the most common cause of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage in the elderly population is trauma, especially if they are anticoagulant. So remember, uh, the most common cause is trauma in elderly population. Now, non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, this usually occurs, uh, you know, uh, in ambulatory patients. And the most common cause is a ruptured aneurysm. Ruptured aneurysms. Now, why somebody would have aneurysms? Well, this could be by chance. Somebody might have an aneurysm in the uh, brain circulation. Or some people are more prone to have aneurysms in their brain circulation. Now from pediatric point of view, this is not a very common entity, but some kids, some kids, they might have aneurysms in their brain circulation. Now these are the kids who might be having what we call as autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. Now this is a rare condition in which there are dysplastic kidneys uh, leading to hypertension and they've got aneurysm formations in their circulation, especially in the brain. And with hypertension, remember these aneurysms, they can simply rupture causing bleeding in the subarachnoid space leading to what we call as subarachnoid hemorrhage. So ruptured aneurysm is the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage in the young population. If, you know, remember, though, though, though overall this entity is a bit rare, but still if it happens, ruptured aneurysm is the most common cause. And uh, again, uh, the reason mostly uh, aneurysms and uh, it could be because of uh, various underlying conditions. Sometimes they might have an, uh, what we call a malformation. We call it arteriovenous malformation. So basically arterioles, they divide they into 
you know they, they make capillaries and the capillaries go into venules and then this is how the arterial circulation gradually transform into venous circulation but sometimes there might be a direct connection which we call the arterial venous malformation and that would lead to direct pressures high pressures inside the venules and these venules can then burst because of pressure changes and especially if it happens in the subarachnoid space that would lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage and sometimes uh, tumorous uh, benign tumorous growth of the blood vessels again quite rare but that can happen that is known as angioma so if there are angiomas formation uh, in the brain circulation sometimes they can give way they can rupture because of pressure changes leading to subarachnoid hemorrhage so remember if you look at the overall etiology it is traumatic and non-traumatic traumatic most common in the elderly population non-traumatic most common in the young population and especially from pediatric point of view if they have got an underlying associated condition like autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease or like incidental aneurysms or AVM malformation or angiomas well they can they can again it's not necessarily that they will have subarachnoid hemorrhage but like I told you it's uncommon but they can have it so you would never like to miss this entity if these risk factors are present okay now uh, the most important risk factor like where would you consider i told you it is uncommon but where you should be considering it in children i told you if somebody has got like dysplastic kidneys or what we call as autosomal uh, yeah, recessive poly kidney cystic disease or forget about that if somebody has got hypertension because of any reason high blood pressure whether they could be, that is because of hormonal problems whether that's because of uh, let's say kidney problems or any other problems hypertension by and large is the most important uh, risk factor and again acute rise in blood pressure which can occur if somebody has taken caffeine or somebody has got sometimes you know temper tantrums that can also lead to high blood pressure or severe physical exertion these are some of the conditions which can lead to rise in blood pressure and if they've got these pre-existing or predisposing conditions that can lead to uh, what we call as subarachnoid hemorrhage now how does it present like coming down to the clinical presentation remember again it can have it can present with neurological symptomatology but by and large the most common presentation of subarachnoid hemorrhage is headache most common headache now headache can be caused by so many conditions now this is very severe headache we that's why the use thunderclap headache is used for that so usually people would describe it as the worst headache of their life so if somebody is like totally crying in tears holding the head and says like they have been having headaches because of one reason or the other but this is something they have never experienced in their life or they feel like their head is going to burst or there's a volcano which has just erupted in their uh, heads remember this is a very um, sensitive indicator of uh, or um, sign that that symptom as well as that the person might be having subarachnoid hemorrhage usually it is sudden in onset and reaches maximal intensity within a short period of time so within an hour within 60 minutes this would reach its maximal intensity it's not something which is going on for let's say hours or weeks it's usually usually something which develops over like you know minutes to hours with that depending on the pressure changes well any sign any neurological sign can be present for example there might be neck stiffness there might be photophobia or there might be cranial nerve palsies because of the pressure or there might be focal neurological deficits like you know weakness on one side hemiparesis uh, speech defects maybe even seizures so like there's a whole myriad of different neurological signs which can present but by and large the most important uh, symptom would be severe headache so anybody who's got a history of severe headache which develops over minutes to hours you should be considering uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage especially if they have got the risk factors now how do we investigate that thing remember the very first investigation that we usually do is a CT scan so a non-contrast CT scan can pick up because this is a bleed so bleed would appear as a hyperdense lesion uh, in the sylvian fissure or you know uh, in the in, in these in the what you call in the spaces of the sulci or in a form of a thin rim around the brain remember uh, that can be picked up and that's why we say CT non-contrast CT is the most important initial test to begin with if somebody has got uh, thunderclap or severe headache but remember a negative CT does not rule out 
subarachnoid hemorrhage this is very very important so the most definitive test is a lumbar puncture so a lumbar puncture is done and if the lumbar puncture shows blood or uh, shows xanthochromia xanthochromia is staining because of the uh, lysis of the red blood cells so that is the most uh, definitive test for the diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage so if you are clinically suspecting subarachnoid hemorrhage you will go with the ct scan and in most of the cases ct scan would pick up as a like a hyperdense lesion but let's say if the ct is negative and if you are suspecting you should still go with a lumbar puncture so a lumbar puncture if it shows blood in this like you know in the csf or if it shows xanthochromia that is the most like definitive test to uh, diagnose subarachnoid hemorrhage so remember CT scan can sometimes be negative if your suspicion is high go for the, this is the most important uh, message as far as the diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage is concerned now in this slide I would uh, um, show you how the um, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage looks on these non contrast CT of the brain so if you look here you can see a hyperdense lesion uh, within the uh, fissures cerebral fissures so if you see a hyperdense lesion normally there you shouldn't be seeing any hyperdense lesion over here so if there's a hyperdense lesion it simply means that there's been bleed i told you this is a subarachnoid space so subarachnoid space would enter into the fissures as well so you can see or it might be inside the ventricles so here you can see some bleed uh, inside the ventricles uh, here you can see bleed inside the posterior horns of the lateral ventricles so remember if you see hyperdense lesions where you shouldn't be finding hyperdense lesion normally csf appears as black on ct scan so if there are whitish which you call as hyperdense lesions in the fissures like the sulci of the brain it could be any wherever you see the sulci just trace it down if you see whitish shadows over there hyperdense or crescentric you know around the surface of the brain or within the sylvian fissure or within the uh, the the ventricles then remember that is indicative of a bleed in that particular space which is subarachnoid space so this is how it looks on a non-contrast ct remember and you shouldn't be missing it now coming down to uh well sometimes uh, you know in certain certain cases uh, if still the diagnosis is not clear then certain neurologists would like to go for what we call a cerebral angiography in which a dye is injected and then they see if the dye is leaking somewhere but like that would be seldom used and that's only used in very specialized centers so remember ct scan uh, if it is negative and suspicion is high you would go with a lumbar puncture and if still in doubt then the third thing is cerebral angiography so these three things in terms of diagnosis you should always remember now coming down to the treatment again the treatment because this is an emergency you always remember your a b c d z so you will look at the airways if the airways have to be like if the person is uncautious you will have to maintain their airways putting a goodell's tube or maybe intubating them you have to take care of the breathing okay by either begging them or if the breathing is going down obviously you will have to intubate and you know mechanically ventilate them circulation you have to ensure that the blood pressure if it is high you have to gradually bring the blood pressure down and then d and e is obviously look into the glucose and look into the other features so a b c d e is important it's very important that after that that you have to control the bleeding in the subarachnoid space so if there has been bleed uh, you have to ensure that there is no further re-bleed and if there is associated hypertension that has to be uh, brought under control so the target is that the blood pressure uh, systolic blood pressure should be less than 160 you can do it with uh, different drugs usually oral nebetipine is used for these things and it, they say research also shows it, it improves neurological outcomes and especially if uh, the cause has been aneurysm let's say if cerebral angiography has shown that there was a bleeding aneurysm or something then that aneurysm needs to be clipped so that some form of uh, uh, revascularization of the circulation has to be done by the experts obviously they would be the neurosurgeons so clipping or endovascular coiling there are different types of techniques like sometimes it has to be an open surgery sometimes these days we talk about minimal invasive surgery so endovascular coiling is done like you know just to uh, obliterate these types of aneurysms if there are any further aneurysms as well just to decrease the risk of a replete so this is how it is treated they still might have some residual neurological deficits which can be obviously overcome by long-term physiotherapy vocational therapy speech therapy so on and so forth so this was all about subarachnoid hemorrhage remember uh, not very common entity but something which you would never like to miss usually presents with severe headache and 
plus minus neurological signs. Diagnosis is usually by non contrast CT and lumbar uh, puncture and sometimes by a cerebral angiography treated with you will usually because in emergency you will go with ABCDs E and the most important thing is to prevent replete bring down the blood pressure if it is high usually oral lebedipine and if uh, there are other aneurysms or something they need to be treated by endovascular coilings or sometimes by open surgery like where you will just like clip uh, the, uh, the the aneurysms so I hope you have liked this video uh, give me a thumbs up if you liked it and please share it with your friends have a very good day take care and bye bye